Many have come up to me and told me that they were praying for me and that they were following this story. And I want to thank you in advance of you hearing what your prayers were able to do. We're going to start in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 10. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 10. The Bible says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Our message this Sabbath is entitled Tribulations Song. Tribulation Song. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share this testimony and more importantly to share your word. Once again, Lord, I ask just now that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Father, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Out of this, Lord, let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from your throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. This testimony is entitled Tribulation Song because it was songs that got me through the tribulation. In two forms, in one form in the hymns, in the other in the book of Psalms. And so as you see, the scripture is called a prelude. And then the first stanza, I talk about the man before. One of the things when I give this testimony I like to say is that this is not the simply the story of, 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 of defeat and then victory. My career had been going very well. I, I'm a graduate of Oakwood University. When I'm introduced, I always say that was my most important academic experience. Because at Oakwood University, I was cemented into the truths of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I left there and went to medical school at the University of Miami in Florida. Left there and went to Loma Linda University, did a preventive medicine public health residency. As part of that, I got a master's in public health and then um, stayed on as faculty with the family medicine department. I did a family medicine residency at the University of Alabama in Birmingham at Anniston. And then went back to California and did a doctorate in public health at Loma Linda, served on faculty at Loma Linda University uh, as I said, while doing that, I received these degrees in public health, and I decided I wanted to leave uh, academic medicine and go into the actual world of public health. So I left Loma Linda, took a position at the Orange County Health Department, which is called the Orange County Healthcare Agency. And most of you know Orange County, California, is the county just south of Los Angeles County. And so I went down to um, Orange County. I was the medical director for the family health division and worked in, 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 in um, immunization programs and um, um, early childhood programs, maternal child, adolescent health programs uh, for about two years. One of the years while I was there, the physician who was the medical director over the county jails, and Orange County has five jails, he left his post for whatever reason and asked me to sit in and be the medical director for the jails. For about a year, I was the medical director over all five of the jails of Orange County. And while I was there, a job opportunity came available in Pasadena, California. If you know America, you know one of the most prestigious cities for a lot of reasons is Pasadena, California. Many wealthy people live there. It is the home of the Rose Parade. Have you guys ever heard of that? On New Year's Day every year, there's a rose parade. All of the floats are made out of plant parts and flowers. Um, and of course, they have the Rose Bowl there where they play college football, American football. 
Um, it's also where uh, the Los Angeles Galaxy play, actually, the, the we call soccer team. So the, the city is a, is a, is not a big city, but it's, it's very prestigious. And so they had an opening for the director of their health department. And it was, a, I would not only be the director, but also the health officer. I never thought I would actually get the job. I prayed about it. I applied for the job. I was competing with people who'd gone to Ivy League schools their whole lives. And I don't, you know, and I'd gone to, to you know, to, to Oakwood and Loma Linda, and neither of which is um, Ivy League. But let me tell you something. If you are willing to receive Christian education, God is willing to open doors for you. And sure enough, I got that job. And I was working in Pasadena, and things were going incredibly well. We passed an ordinance banning smoking in multi-unit housing buildings. Crazy. So that if the smoke from one apartment drifted into another depart apartment, you could call the health department and we could tell those people, hey, you can't smoke because you're impacting someone in the other apartment with asthma or COPD or whatever it is. We also passed an ordinance around food and the city could not serve food that didn't meet certain nutritional guidelines, uh, both of which were very difficult. In fact, when we, when we passed the nutritional guidelines, they took all the sodas out of every vending machine in the city and put in water bottles. And man, I started getting hate calls. The police department, two police started calling me, hey, are you Dr. Walsh? Man, don't you know we're the police, we need caffeine? All they're giving us is water because of you. The most meaningful work I did was around HIV and AIDS. And I had served, by that time I'd already served um, as an advisor on one of the councils in George W. Bush's administration. And I'd served on a council on HIV for a little while for Barack Obama as well. Uh, we decided where monies would be sent, spent through uh, Pacha, um, so specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, and of course also in the United States to combat um, the AIDS and HIV epidemics. In Pasadena, I began to be able to bring money, and in fact, I brought in about $8 million into the city to run uh, enhanced HIV programming. Predominantly who we served were low-income uh, MSMs, which are men who have sex with men, which is the public health term that they use. So that was predominantly who we served. We started a dental clinic, um, which was probably only city-run dental clinic um, in the whole country, definitely in the state of California. And we primarily took care of individuals with HIV because many dentists don't like taking care of that population. Um, so that's what we did. And I thought for sure, every program we touched was working incredibly and being blessed. And I remember sitting at my desk in Pasadena and saying, thank you, Jesus, for this Joseph experience. Because everything, I everything we touch is like it just prospers. The problem is, I didn't realize I was still at the coat of many colors stage of the story. And that there was a whole lot of trouble still to come. And I want to say, and the reason I put this into the testimony is, I want to let you know that the devil does not just use failure to try and dis to take you away from God. The devil will also use success. In fact, Satan is happy to give you success if it's success that will separate you from God. Happily give you success. And sure enough, I started going to fundraisers in mansions in Beverly Hills. And um, the company was different. I want you to follow what I'm saying. Thank you. I started to hang out at, you know, at events, all work-related, where the conversation was not befitting for a Christian. Slowly but surely, even though I was the associate pastor at the Altadena Seventh-day Adventist Church, I was the only pastor there for about six months. By then, another pastor joined me, and I was pastoring like half-time, working full-time as a physician. It was interesting because I could feel spiritually there was a drain on me because of where I was working. And I would make small compromises, meaning if conversations were not the kind of conversations a Christian should even listen to, I would stay around. I started going to these events where they were drinking lots of alcohol. I wouldn't drink, but I was there. 
And I want to tell you that eventually I started to slip more and more and do things and compromise on different things. And, and, I, and, I, and I knew it wasn't pleasing to God, but I felt that God was blessing me in success on the job so much that I continued to do it. And, and, and I realized after and in the storm that God allowed the storm to pull me out of where I was. Because I needed it. The Bible says it like this. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and do what? And repent. And take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. While I was being successful at work, I was invited to be the speaker for the mayor of Pasadena's prayer breakfast. So in about March, I think it was, of 2012, they invited me to pray uh, to be the speaker for this prayer breakfast. All of the dignitaries, senators, congressmen. Um, the, you know, the heads of all the departments of the cities that I, that I served with all showed up, and I, I planned, I prayed, I delivered a message. When I was done, I got a standing ovation. Let me tell you something. The devil loves to give you applause. The devil wants you to like prestige. You know how many preachers are ruined? Because they're more concerned with how many people they're preaching to than they are with the quality of what they're preaching. And so I did this thing, and, 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 and I started getting speak, invitations to speak. I spoke at almost all the Sunday churches in Pasadena, even the mega church there. I was speaking all over the place. I was, I was, the, 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 the time in this job was amazing to the point where a couple years later, in about February, March of 2014, I got an invitation to be the commencement speaker for the city college, Pasadena City College. The way our, our institutions of higher education work in the States, you finish high school, you have an option to do a two-year community college, city college, you can do four-year college, and then after that, we kind of call it university. So it's a little different, but similar. So the two-year school asked me to come and speak, and I, when the president of the school called me, I said, why do you want me to speak? He said, well, I was at the mayor's prayer breakfast two years ago, and I think you would be good to speak to our students. Flattery. Boy, flattery will get you in a whole lot of trouble, church. And so I said, all right, I didn't, I want to do it. In fact, I asked, I remember asking him, I said, you know, I saw on the short list of people to speak, I saw people like Magic Johnson and other celebrities. Why would you want me to speak? It seemed fishy. The truth of the matter is he was not telling me the whole story. By this time, you know, I had people in Pasadena who had seen the job I was doing and they were knew the Obamas and they were trying to submit my name to be the Surgeon General. And so I thought, you know, this is just carrying that wave. The Surgeon General is the top medical doctor in the entire United States. And so they were, you know, I, I, I said, well, you know, maybe God is just moving in this direction. And I, you know, I didn't think about it, didn't pray about it. I just took the speaking engagement. But in taking the speaking engagement, the storm began. In America, commencement speeches at universities are very, very political. In fact, conservative Christians are really basically not wanted on most college campuses. And so what they didn't tell me, what the president didn't tell me, which I think someone else in his office was trying to tell me, kept trying to set up meetings with me, and we, it never happened, is that they, he had rescinded the offer to another speaker. The other speaker was an Oscar-winning Hollywood film producer. In fact, he made a movie or produced a movie called Milk on the life of Harvey Milk, who was a gay activist in San Francisco who was unfortunately assassinated, uh, I believe, by a fellow uh, city council member. And he is actually also a graduate of Pasadena City College. Had they told me that, I'd have said, you know what? He should speak because I didn't go to the school. I have no ties to the school, and he's won an Oscar. I don't have an Oscar. I don't have a Grammy. 
I don't have a chamois. I, I mean, I don't have anything, right? So I figured he should speak, not me. I would have, I mean, that's what I would have said, but he didn't tell me that. He rescinded the offer. My name went into the newspaper that I was going to be the one speaking. And once my name went in the paper, students in the school from the LGBT community felt that they had been slighted because a gay activist had been pulled and I had been put in. I've read their Facebook page. They were the Students for Social Justice is what they were called. And they, and they basically say, look, you know, we don't really have a problem with Dr. Walsh, but, you know, we're going to fight to get our speaker to speak. And so <laughs> what I found out later on is that the reason that the first guy was pulled is because the community college had had a, had a relatively significant sex scandal. The professor who taught the pornography class, I, I was going to wait, I gotta, every time I give this, I got to wait for people not to bathe over people. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, they have a pornography class? Yes, and don't try to sign up for that school. Um, so the professor of the pornography class was found to be sleeping with some of the students. Not sure why that was such a surprise, personally. Um, and that had made it into the news. And when that got into the news, the school was embarrassed. I said, I'd have been embarrassed for teaching a class, just having a class like that, but... The school was embarrassed, and so they found out that the guy that was supposed to speak, there was allegedly a tape of him online with an underage boy. I don't know if it's true, because I definitely did not go Google to find out if that was true. I don't think it turned out that the, the age was the age, but really didn't matter to me. Had I known all of this, I'd have just stayed out. And so he wanted someone else to speak, and that's why. So when these students for social justice, found out that their speaker was pulled because of things that were found online, in order to discredit me, guess where they went? They went online. And you know, I'm a black man in America. Let me just be honest with you. They wanted to, they, I'm sure they thought they was going to find some drug charges, domestic violence. They probably thought they were going to find some dirt on me. They couldn't. You know what they found? Sermons. Lots of them. And they took time. Let me tell you something. I, I found out later on, I realized that the amount of time it took them to watch all the sermons they had to watch, on Judgment Day, they will be without an excuse. <laughs> they will stand before God. He's going to say, y'all did listen to all sermons. Y'all listened about 20 of them. Where are your children? <laughs> um, and so, they, you know, um, they listened to all the sermons, and what they did is they began to pull out bits and pieces of the sermons out of context, and then they public it was then they turned that over to a magazine called Out Magazine, which is one of the premier LGBT magazines in Southern California, um, and they published a dossier, an article on me, and all the reasons why I should not be allowed to speak at this college. And let me tell you something, church. We think persecution is going to come like it came in the Bible. With the advent of social media and the internet and Google, you can be persecuted and never leave your house. A firestorm began. And they, I mean, after, of course, the comments, the Los Angeles Times picked this up. Now, the largest newspaper in the United States, I, I believe it still is, the New York Times, Second largest is the Los Angeles Times, a readership probably in the millions when you look at all the articles they put out. And one of the, uh, one of the ladies who writes in editorials wrote an editorial about me the day after the first article came out. And she said in the, uh, in the, in the editorial, Dr. Walsh should never hold a scientific position in the United States of America. She said, I give, I'll give you two reasons he should never hold a scientific position. Number one, she said, he believes that God created the world. She says that disqualifies him from holding a scientific position. That's interesting when you consider even Einstein believed in God. And God you know, I mean, many of the great scientists in history were all believers in God and creation. 
In fact, she brings, a, uh, um, she brings in an um, evolution expert. She actually called to try to interview me. But I got all kind of calls for interviews from the TV networks, the newspapers. And every time I wanted to defend myself, God would whisper in my ear, like a lamb led to the slaughter is dumb, so said he not a word. And I knew I wasn't supposed to say anything. She had this evolution expert say, if Dr. Walsh, in the article, now this is an editorial in the LA Times, if Dr. Walsh does not want to believe in the, in, in the um, theory of evolution, then he also should not believe in the theory of gravity. And he's supposed to be the expert. <laughs> I was reading and I said, but gravity, uh, gravity is not a theory. <laughs> gravity is a law. If I take something and throw it up in the air, it comes back down at 9.8 meters per second squared. I can calculate how long it's going to take to hit the ground based on how much wind is in the room, how much density the air has, et cetera, et cetera. I can calculate it and reproduce it every time. Evolution is a theory. And the reason the world scoffs at our belief in a God who creates, we're talking about this in the Sabbath school lesson, the reason the world scoffs at a God who creates is because if God is lying in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, how can you believe him in John chapter 3 and verse 16? So you got to be willing to stand and fight for the idea. If God couldn't create you, he can't redeem you. That was the first thing. He believes God created the world. Then the second thing she said it in this editorial was, she said, in one of my sermons, I say, I don't want my children to wish upon a star. I say, I want them to pray to the living God. And she said, he hates Disney. <laughs> you know, because Disney say, because when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference. Now, I have a sermon. I talk about how the, the, the influence of spiritualism through Disney and all of the witchcraft and obia and voodoo and all the stuff they put in there. There's no Christian characters in Disney cartoons. But let me tell you something. In Southern California, see here, you got Buckingham Palace and you got a royal family. We got one too. It's at Disneyland. They got a castle and the king is Mickey and the queen is Minnie Mouse. And if you mess with Disney, you're in trouble. Let me tell you something. And she put that editorial out in the Los Angeles Times, the second largest paper in America, and it went poof across the country. The next day, I was getting calls from Channel 5 News in Los Angeles. In fact, they called the church for permission to play clips of my sermons on television. I told the church secretary, tell them No. Unless they're going to cut me a check. I don't want them playing my sermon on TV. What's wrong with them people? But they did it anyway. They played a clip of my sermon. Now, once I saw it, I, was, I, was, I think I was at the tire shop getting my tire fixed on my car. And it came on. And I saw the clip. And I said, well, thank you, Jesus. At least that was a good clip of a sermon. That was a good sermon. <laughs> at least they're playing a good sermon on Channel 5 News. And before it was all over, it spread. All the little newspapers, the Pasadena Star News, the small newspaper that just really kind of covers the Pasadena area, Altadena, that little area of, of, of L.A. County. The guy who ran the newspaper, I believe, is like an atheist Catholic, which I found many of those in, in Southern California. They don't believe in God, but they're Catholic. I don't know. I have time to get into that now. And he hated the city. So... A seven-day Adventist was a great, a seven-day Adventist who worked for the city was a great target. And, of course, his newspaper is failing. So I, he, he puts four articles out on me the next day, calling for me to be fired from the city. He gets quotes from the Catholic League in New York City. The Catholic League puts out in the paper, I should be fired for my, what I believe the Catholic League came after me. Four articles, my face on the front page of the paper. And that man ran articles against me for weeks after that. I was on the front page picture. And he never just ran the article. He always put my picture next to it. For weeks. And man, the fire started. 
I, I mean, it was like I couldn't even go outside in the city. I could feel the weight of what was happening as they began to malign me and attack me in the press. And many of you read and saw some of these articles. And most people stop there. They don't know what happened afterwards. I remember laying on my face, church, laying on my face for two days straight when this started. And I remember laying there and I could feel physical weight pressing down on me from the demonic forces that were trying to destroy me. And every now and again, I could feel the weight on my back ease up. It lift up off of me. And I remember crying out to God and saying, Lord, what just happened? And the Spirit of God whispered in my ear and he said, someone just prayed for you. The storm was brutal. And they started coming after me. And what I found was that the Psalms became my medicine. And prayer became my anxiolytic. In other words, my anti-anxiety medicine was to pray. One of the Psalms I looked at, Psalm 35, 11, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But in mine adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Look at verse 17. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. Psalm 31 says, I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel, for I've heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. 2 Timothy uh, 4 and verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I felt isolated and alone as daily the barrage of attacks continued. And I started asking God why. And someone sent me this, the spirit of prophecy. Meeting difficulties develops spiritual muscle. It's his providence that brings us into varying circumstances. In each new position, we meet a different class of temptations. How many times when we are placed in some trying situation, we think, this is a wonderful mistake. How I wish I had stayed where I was before. And that's what I was, I said, Lord, why didn't I stay at Loma Linda? Why didn't I stay in Orange County? But look at what Ellen White says. She says, but why is it that you are not satisfied? It is because your circumstances have served to bring new defects in your character to your notice. But nothing is revealed but that which was in you. In other words, the reason trial is so uncomfortable, church, is because we are not inwardly ready to trust God fully. And the trial isn't... It's, if Jesus is in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. And the problem for many of us, we're in trial and we're so panicked and we're fretting. It is a character defect, not the trial that's causing your discomfort. I don't know why it says God's people will be refined by time of trouble. The assaults of Satan are fierce and determined. His delusions are terrible. But the Lord's eye is upon his people and his ear listens to their cries. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them. But the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. Did you see that? But it is needful, look at this, it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. God, I came to the conclusion as I was going through this process, it took a little while. Let me say I was stubborn with it. It took a little while, but I came to the conclusion that God had earthliness in, on me that he wanted to burn off. So he allowed trial to come my way to humble me. 
Ellen White quotes Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. The furnace fires are not to destroy, but to refine, ennoble, sanctify. Without trial, we would not feel so much our need of God and his help, and we would become proud and self-sufficient. In the trials that come to us, we should see the evidences that the Lord's eye is upon us and that he means to draw us to himself. It is not the whole, but the wounded who need a physician. It is those who are pressed almost beyond the point of endurance who need a helper. She says the fact that we are called upon to endure trial proves that the Lord sees something in us very precious which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, watch this, he would not spend time in refining us. He would not take special pains in pruning brambles. Look at the last sentence. Christ does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he tests. Somebody in here is going through something. And I want to tell you, you're going through it because the God of the universe, a God of love, sees something worthwhile in you. She says, the blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction in order that he may see what temper they are of and whether he can mold and fashion them for his work. It may be that much work needs to be done in your character building, that you are a rough stone which must be squared and polished before it can fill its place in God's temple. You need, look at this, you need not be surprised if with chisel and hammer God cuts away the sharp corners of your character until you are prepared to fill the place he has for you. No human being can accomplish this work. Only by God can it be done and be assured that he will not strike one useless blow. His every blow is struck in love for your eternal happiness. He knows your infirmity and works to restore, not to destroy. From the devotional to be like Jesus, page 246, when trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. Look at this. However unjustly we may be treated, let not passion arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, we injure who? Ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. There is by our side a witness, a heavenly messenger, who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy. He will shut us in with, with bright beams of the sun of righteousness. Beyond this, Satan cannot penetrate. He cannot pass this shield of holy light. When you are in trial, there's a limit to how far God is going to allow Satan to go with you. Earlier in 2014, I had applied for a job with the state of Georgia, the state where Atlanta is. And I'd done two FaceTime interviews with them, and they really liked me, and so they, um, they called me back. And the very week that these articles dropped... The state of Georgia called me to come to interview in person for, to be the district health officer for all of northwest Georgia, the area, and for those of you who know where Wildwood uh, is, it's that area of Georgia. And I said, look, God has sent me deliverance. I'm going to leave a blue state and go to a red one. That may not make a whole lot of sense in England, but basically Georgia is in the Bible Belt. In fact, they used to call Georgia the buckle of the Bible Belt. And so I thought, okay, God is going to spare me. He's going to move me out of here. In the process of that, for that to happen, something else happened. And when the whole thing had started, I reached out to some of my friends who worked in the North American division and worked in the Religious Liberty prop, uh, Department. They're not very close friends. People I'd met, I've spoken to for their church's men's ministry. So I called one of these guys and I said, listen, I need your help. Um, I am being, I'm under fire here um, for my religious beliefs, basically. The city of Pasadena, by then, had asked me to resign. They put me on, on um, leave of absence. I didn't know that was a bad thing. They told me they'd pay me to stay home. 
And I said, okay, I'll take that. Um, I'll stay home and get paid. And the, and the, the head of the HR department for the city, Pathy, was a, was a staunch liberal. She did not want me to get my severance. And when I was going into that meeting, I had to pray. That's the first victory God gave me in this whole thing. I had to pray. I said, Lord, you know I'm going to need this money. I'm about to be um, semi-unemployed. I'm a Jamaican, so I always got at least three jobs. So it wasn't just, you know, I was still moonlighting at the urgent care, and I was still pastoring. So, you know, you got to put your hustle on. Um, so I said, Lord, I'm going to need this money. I went in there. She said, you're only getting half your severance. Now, she didn't know myself and the city manager had already discussed it, and I had in my pocket an agreement that I would never bother sue the city and they would give me my full severance. And she slapped the paper down. You're getting half the money. I said, listen, lady, if you don't give me all my severance, I'm going to sue you. I didn't know it feels so good to say that to people. <laughs> it was like a relief. She knows the laws of, of HR in the United States, human resources. So she backed down. She said, but this is the only paper I brought. And I whipped out of my paper, pat on the paper like a Jamaican slamming a domino. I put that thing down on the paper on the table. And I said, we're going to sign this document. And, she, and we, that's what we signed, and I got my severance. But one of the things that happened when I called for religious liberty help, the guy I talked to said, listen, we heard about your case. And he said, but unfortunately, we were all excited to come to your aid. He said, but it came from above our head that we were to distance ourselves from you. The next day in the Pasadena Star News, the article came out, signed by the Central Cal the Southern California Conference, even though I know the lady whose name was on it, and she and I talked, she showed me her emails, she didn't write it. It came from higher up. And they said, look, we don't, we don't, he's not ordained, he doesn't speak for us. They basically threw me under the bus. And can you imagine the critics, how they laughed at me, that the church for whom I was preaching and working, basically said, he's not one of us. At this point, I went into a state of depression, man. Loneliness. It's very difficult. I'll tell you a part of the story I usually leave out. And that is at the time, my wife at the time told me I would be making no more money she took my children and left me. I usually don't say that part of it. Later filed for divorce. Some very dark and evil things happened that I won't bring up here. And, and church, I was literally left alone. The persecution was far more complete than what you saw if you were just looking at media quotes. I was alone and I was hurt and I was mad at God. I remember when I when I um I was going to speak for the Haitian Youth Federation in New York and Connecticut. Left Los Angeles and flew into JFK or LaGuardia. When I landed, I had already done the interview in Georgia by this time. But the people in Georgia had begun to hear. In fact, um, um, when they announced, they actually offered me the job in Georgia. And I thought I was safe. When they put in the newspaper in Georgia that they offered me the job, the news got back to California. The activists in California put in the LA Times and in the Pasadena Star News, we have friends in Atlanta. He will not get that job. They said, we will follow him wherever he goes. And they came after me. When I landed in JFK and LaGuardia, I, after the interview now, I was waiting, you know, just trying to work it out. They'd offered me the job. In fact, when they offered me the job, I said, you're not paying me enough. I need a raise before I start. I pray bold stuff sometimes, church. <laughs> and they agreed, and they gave me a raise before I started. And they were willing to share, help me with housing. They were, they were so excited. Later on when I read their emails, I, they were so excited to have me. They said they would never get someone with my qualifications ever applying for a position like that in the state of Georgia again. They were so excited to have me until the activists came to them and said, listen, you can't hire him. And sure enough, when I landed in New York and I checked my cell phone after as everyone was getting off the plane, 
and I looked at my phone. I had a call from the state of Georgia. They left me a voicemail, and they said, Dr. Walsh, after looking at everything, we're sorry, but you don't have a job with us. But they forgot to hang the phone up, and I could hear them mocking me and laughing at me in the background. And church, let me tell you something. I sat on that plane as everybody else was getting off. I sat in that seat, and for the first time in the whole ordeal, weeks in now, I wept. I just started to cry because I said, God, how much do you expect me to handle? I was taught, Lord, that you don't give us more than we can bear. I said, Father God, I can't bear anymore. And I sat there alone and wept all by myself. Again, to read the Psalms again. Psalm 22 and verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. But you are holy, O oh, you that inhabit the praises of Israel. And that verse 3 became important because you know what I learned? I began to realize that when I was depressed, I also needed to sing hymns. Hymns. Not the new stuff. The new stuff ain't do nothing for me. That was like Kool-Aid when I needed some cough syrup. I went back and I began to sing a hymns. My mother's favorite hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. I began to sing the hymns and the Bible says here that when you praise God, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And I began to praise God in order to feel him draw near in my loneliness and in my depression. My favorite Bible or the Bible verse I went to the most was in 1 Kings 19 and verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness speaking of Elijah. And came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. It is enough now, for I am not better than my father's. Church, for the first time in my life, I sat there alone, and I prayed. Father God, if you don't want to wake me up tomorrow morning, it's okay. I was so depressed, so upset I wasn't suicidal. I wouldn't kill myself like Elijah. But like Elijah, I prayed. I said, Lord, you can take my life. Isn't it interesting? Elijah is the only person in the Bible who prays for God to take his life and then never dies. <laughs> when the time comes for Elijah to depart, chariots of fire come and get him. In, 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 in regards to the church, this text came to me as I was reading the psalm. Psalm 55, 12 says, For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. Verse 13 says, But it was you, a man mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. Ellen White says it like this. She says, Troublous times are before us. In many instances, friends will become alienated. Without cause, men will become our enemies. The motives of the people of God will be misinterpreted, not only by the world, but by their own brethren. The Lord's servants will be put in hard places. A mountain will be made of a molehill to justify men in pursuing a selfish, unrighteous course. The work that men have done faithfully will be disparaged and underrated because apparent prosperity does not attend their efforts. By misrepresentation, these men will be clothed in dark vestments of dishonesty because circumstances beyond their control made their work perplexing. They will, be, they will be pointed to as men that cannot be trusted, and this will be done by members of the church. Ellen White says, God's servants must arm themselves with the mind of Christ. They must, must not expect to escape insult and misjudgment. They will be called enthusiasts and fanatics but let them not become discouraged. God's hands are on the wheel of his providence, guiding his work to the glory 
of his name. One of my favorite quotes came from the fifth volume of the testimony. She says, when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, look at this, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of the truth and right to the stand in, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, we must gather. Look at this line. This is one of my favorite lines in all of the writings of Ellen White. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Church, I made up my mind that their coldness that I was given was going to be warmth. I made up my mind that the cowardice that they had was going to be courage on my end. And I made up my mind that their disloyalty would birth more loyalty in me. People start calling me. Listen, bro, I saw what the church did to you. I'm going to stop paying tithes because of what they did to you. I said, man, you know you ain't paying nobody tithe in 20 years, man. Don't, <laughs> don't be calling me talking about you're going to use me as an excuse. Not to pay your tithe. You better pay your tithe, boy. <laughs> Other folk call me, man. They say, listen, I, you know, I'm not, I'm going to leave the church. I'm leaving the church because they did you so dirty. I said, don't you dare leave God's church. Not on my sake. Don't you do it. When you go, when you go out looking whales in California, they take you on a boat. It gets all shaky. I was on one of those one time, and it got real bad, and people start getting seasick. People started throwing up. I was hiding in the back up against the wall so I wouldn't get sick. I heard one man say, if they don't calm this boat down, I'm going to jump off into the water. I said, man, this is the Pacific Ocean. Are you crazy? <laughs> Do you know how cold that water is? Do you know how big the shark? Man, you'll be an appetizer. I'm not jumping in there after you. Listen, I don't care how bad the ship of the church gets. I don't care how much bouncing around we do in it. I don't care how much vomit others release into it. The safest place is still in the church. Ellen White says it like this. God has a church upon the earth who are his chosen people, who keep his commandments. He is leading not straight offshoots. Don't tell me about you're going to join some historical group or some feast-keeping group or some anti-Trinitarian group. He does not have offshoots. Not one here and one there. God has a people. Guess what? You and I are part of God's remnant church. She says there is no need to doubt, to be fearful that the work will not succeed God is at the head of the work, and he will set everything in order if matters need adjusting at the head of the work. She says, God will attend to that. And work to right every wrong. Let us have faith that God is going to carry the noble ship which bears, or which bears the people of God safely into port. Did you hear that? If you stay put, God's going to get you there safely. The fourth stands is the cleft of the rock. I'll go through this quick. I only have about 15 more minutes. You might as well put that down. Um, when I was there, I, I, was, I, I went to my, good, my best friend's house, and he said, listen, what are you going to do? You don't have a job. This is after everything fell apart. George had rescinded their job. I resigned the other job. And I was sitting with him. I said, you know, I've always wanted to be a missionary. I said, I wanted to go to Guam. He said, Guam? I could tell he had no idea where Guam was. And I said, yeah, I've always wanted to go to Guam and be a missionary, but I was always so busy with my career, I never made time to go be a missionary. And he said, Guam? Boy, that sounds like, I don't know. Church, within 30 minutes of me telling him that on his couch in his house, 30 minutes later, I got an email from the physician recruiter of the Guam Seventh-day Adventist Clinic. That's how specific God was. She said, Dr. Walsh, we here at the Guam SDA Clinic would love to have you come and serve as a medical missionary. Within a few weeks, I had my license to practice medicine in Guam, and I was on a plane 
into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I call that God hiding me in the cleft of the rock. The Chamorro people, who are the indigenous people of the island of Guam, an island only 32 miles wide, by, uh, 32 miles long by 8 miles wide. Much of it, about a quarter of it, is covered by U.S. bases. It's a U.S. territory. So the military, the Navy, and the Air Force cover much of the island. There's not a whole lot of island. When we went to land and the plane turned to land, I looked out the window and didn't see nothing. It was the middle of the night. And I said, Lord, have mercy. We're about to land on the, on the water. They turned again, and this beautiful island lights up. We land in Guam, and Dr. Robinson, who's the, who's the medical director at the time, greets me, a good Christian man, greets me and shakes me at my hand, 2 o'clock in the morning. On the way to Guam, I kept telling God, I quit. On the plane, I said, Lord, I'm not preaching again. I will never preach again. I said, Lord, I quit. If this is what preaching gets me, I'm being sent to modern-day Patmos. <laughs> I said, Lord, if this is what preaching gets me, I'm... I'm, I, I, I said, Lord, all I've worked for, this is where I'm going. I said, I quit, Lord. I got off the plane. Dr. Robinson shook my hand, grabbed my bags. We began to walk to the car. He said, oh, Dr. Walsh, we've been listening to you on Audioverse. You're scheduled to preach Wednesday night. <laughs> the psalmist says, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. She says in verse 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. The next stage, the last stage, is this one. I had to find a way to fight because I, f I knew what happened was wrong. I began to get calls from religious liberty organizations all over America wanting to take my case. And I had no idea how to choose an attorney. One of them took it upon themselves to do a freedom of information request. There's an act in the United States, a law, that if a government does something, you can make a request and they have to turn over all the information related to it. It's called the Freedom of Information Act. And so one of these groups did that and got all the information from Pasadena and the state of Georgia. And when they read it over, especially Georgia and Pasadena, but I'd already signed an agreement with Pasadena, he said, you have a case against the state of Georgia. We, wanna, uh, we want to represent you. And I said, Lord, how? So I started where I said, Lord, I'll know who I'm supposed to sign with. Most of them wanted to fax me a paper. I sign it and fax it back. I said, I'll know who I'm supposed to sign with because they will call, but they will also be willing to fly to Los Angeles, and they'll be willing. They're going to take me to lunch. They're going to want to invest and spend time with me. I got a call from First Liberty Institute out of Dallas, Texas. Jeremy Dice, a phenomenal Christian lawyer, calls me and says, Dr. Walsh, we've been following your case. He said, we are going to come to Los Angeles, and we're going to take you to lunch. They flew in. They took me down the street from the conference office in, in, um, in, um, in, uh, in the town next to Pasadena. Slips my mind suddenly. And we went to the Galleria in Glendale, Glendale, California. And they, I started to tell them the whole story. They told me, listen, you've got a case. I whipped out my cell phone, and I played for them. I played for them the voicemail of the state of Georgia laughing at me. And the two lawyers high-fived each other. <laughs> I said, man, that's not funny. Well, y'all high-fiving each other. He said, you see, Dr. Walsh. He said, you see, Dr. Walsh. He said, you see, Dr. Walsh. Every time we take one of these religious liberty cases in the United States, God gives us a sign, a piece of evidence that tells us in advance we're going to win the case. He said that voicemail was the sign. Long story short, we, we went, we filed um, a case with the Equal Opportunity, EEOC, I forget what it all stands, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission at the federal government. The Obama administration was still in power and they wrote a bogus response like 11 months later of how I had no religious, li no, you know, no, no, um, no case, and there's nothing that the state of Georgia had done wrong. Shocking, because if you read the First Amendment, you, you, basically you can't discriminate against someone because of what they believe, which is exactly what happened. And I, by now, had to come back from Guam. It was like a year later, and um, 
So I, 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 um, I started praying. I said, Lord, I need a job in the States. One of my friends got me the job to be a chief medical officer for a homeless Christian homeless clinic in Riverside, California. Half time, no benefits, so I could safely come back. I started doing my Jamaican thing, started working all over the place, <laughs> hustling. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And then um, I finally said to God, you know, Lord, I need, I need a job with some benefits, and I need to settle into one place. This is crazy. And one of the places I was moonlighting, and I said, Lord, I'll know who I'm supposed to go, take a job with. And what I did was I wrote out for God. You know how Hezekiah laid out the letters when the king of Assyria was coming against Israel? Let me tell you something. I get a bill I don't like. I lay it out on the, I lay it out in front of me. I figured if Hezekiah, it worked for Hezekiah. I, I pray over stuff. So I wrote out exactly how much money to the decimal point I needed to make to make up for all that I had lost. Being a missionary didn't pay like being a practicing physician did in the States. And so I got on my knees and I prayed over it. And one of the places I was moonlighting, the CEO called and said, Dr. Walsh, we want to talk to you. The CMO and I want to take you to lunch. We want to talk to you. So I went with them to lunch, and she sat down, and she said, listen, we want to offer you the job to be the medical director of our urgent care. And she wrote down a number on the paper and slid it across the table. Church, it was the exact number I had written down in prayer to the decimal point of how much they were willing to pay me. And I knew I was going to take that job. So I lived in Bakersfield, California, for three and a half years as a medical director there. Crazy. That's how God works. So when my attorneys came back to me after I'd had this job and was comfortable now, they came and said, listen, we lost this, but we want to sue the state of Georgia. And I started saying, you know, every time we mess around with stuff, it gets in the media, and the whole firestorm starts all over again. I'm thinking I might want to just sit this one out. Things are good again. I, peace has found me once again. Maybe I should just sit this one out. And they made an argument to me that was profound. He said, you see, in your denomination, you Seventh-day Adventists, you hire your preachers and give them a salary. You give them benefits. You even give them discounts on Christian education. They said most of, or many of the preachers and pastors in America are bivocational, meaning they work all day at one job and handle their pulpit on Sunday. He said, if you allow this to fly, you put in jeopardy the ministries of all those pastors across the country. If it ever gets out that they said something that shouldn't have been, that, that is politically incorrect or shouldn't have been said, they will lose their job and possibly their pulpit. You have to stand. Listen, I got afraid because I, I hated being in the media. You don't understand. It was horrible. And when I went to answer them, one of my favorite Bible verses automatically came out. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's just what came out. And I said, we'll do this. Sure enough, they signed the thing, and we went to fight against the state of Georgia in court. And then I got the thing back from the state of Georgia where they asked for discovery, and they wanted me to turn over every sermon I had ever written, every contract with the church I'd ever signed as a pastor. They wanted to know if my online sermons made me any money. I said, that's an easy answer. That's a no, zero. Not one red penny have I ever made online for doing anything. When, and my attorney said, in fact, if you wrote a sermon on a napkin, you got to turn the napkin over. If you wrote margins in your Bible about sermons, you got to turn those Bibles over. And I said, man, this is crazy. But when they started talking about it at the law firm, one of the higher up lawyers, he began to celebrate. He said, listen, this is our inn. They wanted sermons. And I don't know if you remember, but the city of Houston had a mayor who was very left-leaning, and she attacked pastors in the town and requested their sermons to make sure that they were politically correct. Five pastors. The city of Houston, all the Christians 
uh, rallied around those five pastors, and ultimately they voted her out of office and ran her out of Houston. My lawyer said, we're going to do the same thing to the state of Georgia. And so he refused to give the sermons, and what he did was they called a press conference in the state capitol, right around the corner from the governor's office and the attorney general's office for the state. And they set up a podium, and they set up bleachers, and they had me deliver a five-minute address on why religious liberty, religious freedom, the sanctity of the, of the process of sermon production, and why in America this ought not be allowed to stand. And there were the cameras from the TVs again. But this time, church, when I got up to stand to speak, people from the Southern Missionary Baptist Church the Baptist Church, Southern Baptist, Pentecostals, people from all the different denominations in Georgia, except ours, everybody came up on stage. And they went up there and they stood with me. And when I, tears came to my eyes, church, when I turned and I looked back and I saw all these people flanked around me, standing in unis, unity with me, that we will defend our rights as Americans to be Christians. God whispered in my ear, Eric, you were never alone. That night, church, 40,000 people signed a petition that night in my, on my behalf. That one night. I don't know how many ultimately did. I had organizations from D.C. all over the country came. And the psalm that came to me, Psalm 35, says, plead my cause, O Lord. With them that strive with me, fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand for my help. Draw it also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded. That's what you got to pray sometimes. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have, have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. And God sent me back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16 at my first answer. No man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Paul goes on to say, I pray God that it be not laid to their charge. You see that? Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Let me tell you something. My lawyers, some of the state senators from Georgia, one of the state senators when I was at that thing at the state capitol, he shook my hand. He said, listen, you're a preacher. He said, I love the way you preach. I've been listening to you. I had to explain to my lawyers why we as Adventists believe what we believe. I was able to do Bible studies with my evangelical lawyers. Are you getting what I'm saying? God showed me that there are many people who would never have heard the gospel if I wasn't put through the persecution I put through because they went online to find the sermons and listen to them for themselves. I remember in Pasadena when it first started, they, one, of the, one of the articles they put, put links online to four of my sermons, and they said, I said, all of this stuff. I said, none of what they said I said in the, in the, in the, in the article. And, and our PR person at the church listened to the sermons, called the newspaper and said, hey, he didn't say any of this stuff. Where would you get this from? Put the timestamps in the article if you're trying to say he said this stuff. And they hung up the phone on him. They will lie on you, cheat you. I said, Lord, you got to deliver me now. A few weeks later, I thought it would have all been over. But it wasn't. Around December of that year, I was on my knees agonizing with God. I said, Lord, I can't take this anymore. I can't stand being in a legal battle. I want my name cleared. I want this over with, Lord. I'm tired. It's been almost three years now, Lord. While I was praying, church, my cell phone began to vibrate. A text was coming in. When I was done praying, I picked it up, and it was one of my attorneys, Roger, and my heart always went in my throat when they called because I was expecting them to tell me something terrible happened. And I prayed. I called him back. He said, Dr. Walsh, um, we may have some good news. He says, um, the state of Georgia has asked to go to mediation. 
I knew what that meant, but I still asked him because, you know, you got to ask lawyers. You got to be specific with lawyers. I said, so what does that mean? He says that means they may want to settle. He said, I can't promise you anything, but they might want to settle. I said, Roger, you don't understand. I just got off my knees praying that God would bring this whole ordeal to an end. He said, well, Dr. Walsh, if you just finished praying, God answered your prayer yesterday. He said, because they called us yesterday, but because of the time difference, I decided I'd call you this morning. And God whispered in my ear and he said, before you call, I will answer. And let me tell you something. A few weeks, it, after that, it went rapid fire. By the beginning of the next year, that was, I think, 2017, uh, by the beginning of the next year, I was in Atlanta again. I met the mediator. He shook my hand. They put me in a room. They put the state of Georgia people in another room. The mediator was so happy to meet me. I couldn't understand. I said, why is this guy so happy to meet me? He shook my hand. My lawyers were doing calisthenics. They were running, jogging. They were happy. I don't know what was. I said, man, why are you so happy? I'm fasting over here. What are y'all doing, man? Didn't you watch CSI? You got to be serious when you're going to go to court. And then they said, they're just gonna, in order to do the settlement, I got to go sit across from the state of Georgia. They said, Dr. Walsh, do you want to say anything? I said, nope, this whole silence thing has been working so far. I'm not saying nothing now. I got attorneys for that. And they went in there and they went to battle with him. You embarrassed this man publicly. You put his information out on the news. You've damaged his career. And I'm just sitting there. Hmm? Sure did. Sure did. <laughs> we split back up into two separate rooms. And they said they're just going to pass a piece of paper back and forth with an amount, and that's how we're going to settle. I said, what are we, the Flintstones? What? Paper? Can't we text, email? Up? They said, no, we want no evidence of where it, where it went. I said, okay, that sounds good. Now, what's interesting is when I went in the room in the state of Georgia was, all their attorneys, their finance people, Dr. Walsh, good to meet you. Great to meet you, doctor. They're just shaking my happy, smiling. I said, man, this is a trick. But you know what the Bible says? God says, in Psalm 23, that he will present a table for you in the presence of your enemies. The first piece of paper came back into the room, and on it was a six-figure dollar amount. Six figures. My lawyer, man, I thought my lawyers was going to do a Holy Ghost dance at that point. And I said, why are you guys so happy? They said, Dr. Walsh, if this is the first offer, it's over. He said, they came today to settle. While the negotiations went on, I just sat in my chair, pulled back, and I wept again. But this time I sat in my chair, and I wept tears of joy. Because I had realized that the scripture is true. David said, I, I was young, and now I am old. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor is he begging bread. And I sat there and I wept. I said, my God is still with me. Before it was all over, that number doubled. Doubled. And they, the mediator came in and he said, Dr. Walsh, this is the final number they said they're willing to give you. I said, that number looks perfectly fine with me, sir. I'm, I ain't stupid. I'm not going to be arguing I, now, I mean, I'll take it. I wasn't expecting to get nothing really, <laughs> but out of this mess, I'll take it. And one of my attorneys said, no, we won't take it. He said, we want an apology. I said, that's right. We want an apology. <laughs> <laughs> and the mediator went back over to the state of Georgia and he said, all right, they want an apology. He comes back into the room with us. He says, the state of Georgia is refusing to apologize, but they said I'll give you $25,000 to not apologize. I said, listen, I know they wasn't going to mean the apology anyway. I'll take the money. <laughs> listen, where I come from in the hood, shoot, apology don't mean nothing like $25,000. Listen, church, after it was all over, the mediator came up to me and shook my hand. He said, he said, listen, I've been listening to your sermons. The mediator. 
He said, you preach like I preach. He said, if the state of Georgia's Bar Association ever heard me preach, heard my sermons, I'd probably be where you are. He said, sir, you keep preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even one of the attorneys for the other side, when, I, when we, it was over and we were praying, one of them came to try and join us in prayer. Let me tell you something. I serve. You serve. We serve the true and living God. Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. But let me tell you something. That money that I got was, didn't really mean nothing. Some of their lawyers took the money. Uncle Sam, the government took some money. It, 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 I mean, the money didn't really mean a whole lot. God gave me a far more precious gift out of this whole thing. While I was in Guam, a young lady reached out to me to try and encourage me in my struggles. And the first time she reached out, I didn't even respond. We'd met, I'd been preaching in, in Connecticut. I'd preached and she was there and she was going through some very hard times at the time. And we emailed a couple times and I forgot, I forgot who she was, what she looked like. If you preach a lot, that happens. A year later, on Father's Day in June of 2015, she reached out again with words of encouragement, and I responded, who is this? She reminded me of who it was, and, and, and we began to talk, and ask, she was asking me how I'm doing. I was still in Guam. The end had not come, so I was still in a deep state of depression, still in some difficulty, and she began to send me devotionals every day. Call me, even though the time difference is the opposite sides of the world, call and pray with me. Finally, I said, send me some pictures. <laughs> I said, you got to send me a picture, sister. <laughs> the character is right. I just need to see some packaging now. Look, send me a picture. <laughs> and she sent me a picture, and I saw up and said, well, she's not that good looking. The pictures don't look so good. I said, ah, that's all right. We'll just keep being friends. I got reverse catfish, church. Y'all don't even know what that means in England. And so we kept going, being friends. And God allowed that I didn't really look at the pictures good. Because about a year and a half later, after everything had ended on my end, and I'd gone through some hard stuff on that, I flew to Connecticut just to visit with Jackie. She pulled up to pick me up at the airport, and I looked inside. And I said, wait a minute, there's a supermodel waiting here to pick me up. I said, where's the girl in the picture? And I sat in the car with her, and immediately I knew that God was sending me a reward. And to this day, my wife Jackie is my reward. Amen. Amen. And let me tell you something, I know what it's like to have someone who's not serious about church and ministry and to have someone who is. Young people, it makes a world of difference having someone who is serious about Christ with you. Last few slides, just a few last lessons. I will say this, God has restored me. The, the, my, I have a new job now. I'm a medical director over 18 clinics in Connecticut. Um, it's, it's flexible, so I can travel a little bit more, not too much, but a little bit more. Um, God has restored me from that perspective. He, he's done so much for me in so many ways. Uh, we're working on a documentary. I'm going to be writing some books. I was wondering who would publish the book, and I met the people out here, and they said, listen, we want to publish your book. So I, I'm going to ask you to pray for me that God allows me to get all that done. But let's look at the last few lessons so we can finish. Postlude, God has a purpose in sending trial to his children. He never leads them otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose that they are fulfilling. He says it is the triumph of the Christian faith that it enables its followers to suffer and be strong, to submit and to thus conquer. Ellen White says, do not dishonor God by words of repining, but praise him with heart and soul and voice. Look on the bright side of everything. 
Do not bring a cloud or shadow into your home. Praise him who is the light of your countenance and your God. Do this and see how smoothly everything will go. Last couple slides are just some Bible verses. First Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. For the time has come that just judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall, be, and what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Church, I've decided to commit my life to well-doing in Jesus Christ. My favorite verse is now this one, Micah 7 and verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Amen.